there we go. Um, so before we get started, um, before, yeah, before we get going, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're presenting from, the Ngunnawal people, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, yes, as I said, welcome. So, so very happy to have people here in person. Um, now, tonight, uh, for those who've been on the journey as we've been going through uh, COVID lockdown, we've been streaming live on Twitch. We're continuing that tonight. So Brian and I, being somewhat masters of different ways of failing technically, are sure to find a way, new way to fail. So if you're online, hi, we're doing our best. It's in person um, and we'll see how it goes. So please, as always online, provide feedback on how it's happening uh, and how the experience is for you. And we'll see if we can make this the best for both worlds. But so... Tonight, um, we'll have a pretty familiar flow to those who've been in the group before. We'll go through some of the stuff that's come out um, this month and some of the new features and some of those things. In keeping with the theme of previous talks around some nice little life hacks and some of the features that make your life a little easier on AWS, we'll blend some of those in as well. Um, some new white paper updates. We can't spell white. That's a great typo. How good is that, Brian? How long has that been there? I don't know. <laughs> That's so good. Um, so yes, we will have some white paper updates, not what paper updates. Um, but our main presentation tonight is from uh, James and Brian up the back there. There'll be our CDK from beginnings to the real world team development. So uh, very big infrastructure as code session tonight, which is great. Uh, and lastly, there'll be more time to uh, have some more pizza and uh, drinks and stuff afterwards. So let's get going. Um, a part of this, all of the streams and all of the talks that we're going, uh, that we're doing, are recorded. They're live, um, live on YouTube when Brian remembers to do it. Um, so please subscribe to the channel. There's a bunch of all of our previous talks up there as well. Um, lots and lots of great content. New this month, 113 new features uh, this month so far and counting. Um, oh, that was as of nine o'clock this morning, so it might be a few more. Um, what that looks like, because we love graphs and we love data, is, is kind of all of this. So we're following uh, a, a bit of a lull at the moment, but um, with some summit season kicking off, you can expect that to tick up uh, pretty soon. Now, in terms of some of the stuff that's new, um, our new uh, Graviton 3 processor-driven um, there's a lots of cool performance stats about this, but the one I like the most is the fact that you get 60% better efficiency for the same performance. So in terms of your carbon footprint, these processes are a vast step up on the previous generations. So a lot of a lot of power, uh, sorry, a lot of compute power for little actual power, which is great. Um, there's a bunch of other performance increases on that as well, increasing sort of floating point, a whole bunch of other stuff there that I'll let you dive into. But um, secondly. For the security wonks in the room, um, we've got a couple of new security features in EC2. So we've now support Nitro TPM, which um, using our AWS Nitro system provides a TPM 2.0 spec compatible TPM into your EC2 instances. So if you've got an instance on premise that, oh, sorry, an application on premise that requires um, a TPM, you can now run those in cloud. We also have the UEFI secure boot as well. Um, Resilience Hub has added a bunch more support, so Terraform, ECS, um, and some additional service support in there. Resilience Hub allows you to um, look at the resilience of your overall application. So with Terraform support, you can define those applications in uh, Terraform, but it will now run daily checks across your applications and generate a um, resilience score based on the inputs you give it. So it's a great way of monitoring um, changes in your environment and impacts to the application resilience to the levels that you define. Um, super useful little service, recommend checking it out. Um, I'm not gonna go through the entire title of this one, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, RDS, uh, the new multi-availability zone uh, deployment option for them, which gives you a primary in one availability zone and two secondaries in two more availability zones. So um, traditionally it was two, now you've got this three AZ deployment model. Um, this model gives you a lot more resilience and a lot more performance in your RDS instance. So it's designed for production level databases um, and it still uses network storage, for, but it now makes use of local instance store to accelerate transaction commit time. So your transaction commits are a lot faster and your um, failover is now down to about 35 seconds. So for those running RDS databases, this is a really useful um, way to increase your resilience and your performance uh, for your production database instances. Uh, 
MSK serverless is now generally available. So this is in Sydney. Um, it's completely compatible with Kafka and being our uh, serverless version of it, it means that you can now provision uh, clusters and not have to manage a capacity. So uh, in classic AWS manner, we're taking away some of that undifferentiated heavy lifting. So it allows you to get Kafka deployed and run and then not have to worry about managing any of that capacity. Um, super useful now in GA and definitely available in Sydney. Um, one of those little life hacks I was talking about, AWS Step Functions has got a new console experience that really helps with some of the observability and debugging. Now, it's not yet in Sydney, it's, it, it will come in time, um, but this one, if you're a developer, gives you a lot better view at different um, workflows and where and helps you debug your workflows in Step Functions. So Step Functions gives you integration with 200 plus AWS services and 10,000 different um, plus different API calls. Um, so really great way to orchestrate a bunch of AWS services and now it's much, much easier to debug in this new console experience. If you want to go and have a look at it, um, it's uh, have a look at the release. It's in US East and Oregon and a couple of others as well. Uh, some networking stuff for people of that mind. Um, so traffic mirroring, which is a kind of another security focused one. So for those that um, traffic mirroring allows you to redirect traffic from one EC2 instance out into another for things like um, security appliances and things like that, you can now host those behind our gateway load balancer. So it means you can have your IDS, your IPS, or whatever those sort of security appliances that you want to run are behind a gateway load balancer, and that gives you much more resilience and scalability in those monitoring appliances behind that. So if you have the need to redirect traffic from one instance into another, it gives you a vastly superior solution to what used to be. And if you've got any deep questions about that, we're joined by our specialist networking TAM up the back of the room, so Tony can talk to you all about that one. So, um, all righty. Um, Network Firewall also now has AWS managed threat signatures. So what this is, is it gives you AWS provided signatures in your um, network firewall. You get full visibility into these and it will help you uh, mitigate malware um, and a bunch of other threats through AWS Network Firewall and we'll manage that for you as well. There's an um, SNS notification off the back of this. So as changes are made to the rule set, you can get notified if you want. Um, as I said, you get full visibility into those rules as well. So really great way to centrally manage and provide a lot of um, deep threat protection in your AWS environment. Uh, and Private Link announces support for IPv6. So for those who run services behind Private Link, uh, be it a SaaS provider, an ISV or something like that, you can now run your services using IPv6 behind uh, Private Link. Um, Private Link allows you to, uh, in the SaaS or ISV sense, present your service as an endpoint in um, another user's VPC. So it allows you to privately allow access to, uh, to your service. It also works internally in your own organisation to present services as well. Really, really nice feature. A um, couple of little improvements. Um, control Tower. Um, for those of you who do look after your control tower, your um, environment, so control tower gives you your landing zone, your best practice um, foundation to get moving in AWS. Um, if for anyone that's done a bunch of work in control tower, it can be excruciatingly slow previously, as you had to wait for guardrails to roll out, you'd have to roll them out sequentially. And if you had a large number of accounts, that could take quite some time. Um, now, with the ability to support concurrent um, concurrent operations for present preventative guardrails, which are typically performed through service control policies, that can now be done concurrently. So you can um, deploy, if you've got a number of accounts in two different OUs, you can deploy those controls in both OUs simultaneously rather than sequentially that you used to have to do. Um, another one of the nice little improvements in that multi-account environment is the ability to delegate single sign-on administration to a child account. So you can have a dedicated management account. Um, a, a good practice on AWS is to keep people out of your organisational master account. This gives you another thing that you can delegate out to a management account to an appropriate team. So one of those really nice little things. Um, EC2 key pairs, now, like previously, um, you haven't been able to see when the key pairs were created. You haven't been able to see public key material out of those. You can now query it. 
Um, so if you've actually got to think about like the life cycle of key pairs and how long they've been in the environment for, you've now just got a little bit more information to help you do that, which is super useful. Um, also, um, there's some more technical detail behind that. Certain key pairs are now much easier to integrate with tools like Putty if you're a Windows user. So there's a couple of nice little things in that um, for everyone. And another one which would have helped me a few times in my, uh, in my time at Amazon uh, is the ability to protect instances from accidentally being stopped. So with great automation comes great responsibility and uh, sometimes things don't go necessarily as you hope. Um, this is, it works in a very similar way to termination protection. So if you've got a production server that you want to make sure is on all the time and doesn't get stopped, you can now put a little check that means that someone has to go and manually disable this setting before they're allowed to stop the instance and turn it off. So just another great way of just protecting production workloads and making sure that no one accidentally turns them off. From the white paper's point of view, a uh, reasonably quiet month, only six that have been new or updated. Um, I've got sort of three highlights up there. Um, the only new one of those is the modern streaming data analytics architectures on AWS. Um, the update to, to cloud foundations on AWS is, uh, has been up there as well as the real-time communication. They've both been updated. So definitely worth going and have a look on. As always, really useful content. Um, personally, the cloud foundations one is one that I spend a bit of time working with customers in. It's a really succinct way to think about getting an organization started in line with good practice on AWS. So um, yeah, really, really useful content. Um, now, just overnight, we've had the release of a new solution. Now, for those who don't have experience with AWS solutions, it's not a service that AWS runs in the console sense. They're published code that you can go and download and use to get started in a specific way. So in this case, it's a landing zone accelerator. So this is a bit of work that's been happening for a while. So for those of you with a, a high security or high compliance requirements, this is a highly automated, very secure approach to getting started in AWS. Um, all infrastructure is code powered by the CDK that you're going to hear tonight. Um, and it allows people who run the foundations of your cloud environment to manage it all through a, a one little config file. Everything else is done as a product in CDK for you and automated away. So it takes the administrative effort out of managing your foundational environment and makes it vastly simpler day to day for uh, people that are doing that. Um, now, the last dot point in the list on the left is really key. It's supported by our support team. So you can call up um, our support team and say, hey, I'm actually running your um, landing zone accelerator. Here's what I'm seeing and you can get help. For people who've worked with our previous landing zone offerings, that was a bit trickier. Um, this is now a much smoother customer experience. So if you have a need to get started in a, in a secure, fast and automated way, this is an, an excellent solution. It is. And with that, um, that's enough of me for now, and I will hand over to the vastly more attractive and talented Brian. See, intros like that, how on earth can I not have a big head? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brian. So uh, I'm the first half of the main act this evening, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit around about the AWS CDK. So James is going to do the second half of the presentation. He's got some more uh, sort of real-world lessons about things that he's picked up in team development environments, working with some customers. Uh, but I'm going to take you through more of a uh, sort of what is the uh, AWS CDK and why should I care kind of angle to it. Um, and my introduction to CDK slide got to about here before I said, I'm not doing slides. Let's just let's just write some code. Let's do some demo and, and make this kind of interactive, and we'll see where it goes. So if you've got, uh, got questions, comments, or anything you want to see, um, we'll just wing it is basically where I'm going with this. So before I dive in, the CDK, just to give you an elevator pitch about what it is. Um, are we all familiar with the concept of infrastructure as code? Show of hands. We know it. Yep, good. All right, so CloudFormation is the AWS service for that. Now, those who have uh, worked with CloudFormation, you write in YAML or you write in JSON, and you know it, it's great. You can write it all down, it's declarative, and we handle provisioning, and that's kind of cool. But the authoring experience leaves some room to improve, um, you know, particularly trying to build complex constructs. Uh, anyone who's had to go in and try to write a million IAM policies by hand to do you know, best practices around fine-grained permissions and those kinds of things, uh, it can be a little bit verbose and time-consuming. So the premise of what the CDK does, uh, so Cloud Developer Kit, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with the acronym, is to let you use actual programming languages. So we support Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, uh, C Sharp, 
go. Am I missing any? James is, no, okay, good. Um, so pick whichever language you wanna work with and you can model your infrastructure with that. All right, so what I wanna show you tonight is a couple of examples that we're gonna write from scratch in, type, in TypeScript, Ugh, talking. Um, and we're gonna go through and I sort of wanna to prove to you why this is better than writing cloud formation templates by hand. So to get started, um, there's a CLI for it and it's all based in Node. So um, you can download the CDK CLI, um, or just run it like I am here. And I'm gonna start with init, and I'm gonna tell it what language I want. So you can um, pass in any of the other languages we support. We will essentially spit out a project structure for you that is ready to start going and writing uh, your infrastructure as code, as actual code, not just as a template file. Now, the, uh, the thing I like about this is the way that we do it is we actually write the CDK once, um, so we write the base language in, in TypeScript. And then from there, we use a, a framework we've got called JSII to essentially present all of these other language versions uh, in their own languages that all ultimately run as TypeScript. The reason I highlight this is it means that we have complete feature parity in every single language. Right? So anything that I show you today in TypeScript, you can do in any of the other CDK languages, um, which is a really cool selling point. Like it's never, do I need to use language A or language B to, to get some benefits? It kind of doesn't matter. So let's uh, crack up in VS Code and start doing some stuff. And I'm gonna zoom that in a bunch. Give me a terminal. All right, so the, the file structure you get to begin with, there's a couple of things that, that I like to sort of draw attention to. I picked TypeScript, so it's a fairly standard looking node project. I've got a package JSON, I've got a whole bunch of dependencies um, and, and all the usual sorts of things baked in there. The lib directory is where we're gonna start modeling our actual infrastructure. But I also like to highlight that there's a tests directory. Uh, we can go through and write unit tests. And again, we can do this for any other CDK language. It's not just a TypeScript thing. And I can have unit tests on my infrastructure so that as part of my CI CD pipeline for how I release my infrastructure, I can validate it with tests before we even get anywhere near a developer environment or a tester environment or a production environment. So this makes it really easy to pick up quality um, within an IDE, right? These tests can be running constantly in the background. So, you know, this test does nothing, but I've got a little green tick next to it because VS Code has used Jest as my test runner and has you know, given me a little thumbs up on that pointless empty test. Um, but it means that I can bake these things in so that ideally developers can run their tests locally and we can figure out if we're gonna break the infrastructure stuff based on our tests before I even commit code. So there's benefit number one that you, you can sort of get there in cloud formation templates in YAML or JSON, things like um, CFN Lint and CFN NAG and those kinds of things can sort of get you there. Uh, but this uh, ability to have an actual programming language lets us do some really complex things in terms of how we want to validate. But uh, but enough of that, let's let's get in and start doing some stuff. So I'm just gonna delete the, the comment code to begin with. So we, uh, we kick off with a class that extends from a stack all right, so ultimately one CDK app uh, can have many CloudFormation stacks in it is a, is a concept worth getting your head around. Uh, that might be done for breaking things up for logical reasons or deploying you know, stack A to region A, stack B to region B, those kinds of things. Now, to begin with, I'm gonna go and do something really simple. Let's just make an S3 bucket. So I'm gonna say new bucket, and I can see it's suggested I drag in the S3 library there. Demo bucket one and empty property set. That's uh, that's pretty much it, All right? Cool, I've got an S3 bucket. The reason I can get away with it being so uh, shorthand there is that there's no mandatory properties I need to specify for an S3 bucket. It'll just give me a bunch of things as defaults. But let's uh, let's assume I wanted to, to put some properties on it. Straight off the bat, this is benefit number two, IntelliSense. IntelliSense everywhere in every IDE you're working with. Um, so usually if you've written CloudFormation, you've probably had a text editor open on one side of your screen and the CloudFormation documentation open on the other side of your screen so that you can figure out what the properties are and what the right types of values are and those kinds of things. In this case, it's actually gonna do a whole bunch of stuff for me. So let's say I wanted to put a, a specific bucket name on this. Uh, so be our fun, live demo, one, two, three, four, just to make sure it's nice and unique. Um, and I can start specifying these things in. Uh, also, because I'm working in an actual programming language, I can do things like having type checking. It says, hey, I expect a string here, not a number. Um, so 
it gives me uh, that kind of uh, validation as I'm working in my IDE, which again, depending on you know, things like you load, things that you load up into your IDE when working with CloudFormation templates, your mileage may vary. So that's, uh, that's benefit number two. Now let's go and have a look at how we would deploy this. So I'm just going to kill that for a sec. All right, so what I want to do is just CDK deploy from the command line. So what this is going to do is it's going to go through and uh, what we call synthesize the template. So think of this as like a compile step, right? If you write code, we typically compile that out to something that the machine can handle, right? In the case of the CDK, think of it as I'm compiling it to CloudFormation. So what it actually does is it creates a CloudFormation template, right? We're not doing anything different in terms of the actual execution of our infrastructure as code. We're just shortcutting how we create it, right? So uh, you can see what's happening at the bottom here is it's going through and creating my, uh, my S3 bucket, but you know, it's created a CloudFormation change set. It's doing all the usual CloudFormation things. In fact, if I flick over into my AWS account and go into CloudFormation, CDK test stack, in resources, and ta-da, I've got an S3 bucket. So a couple of things to, to sort of go through and show you in terms of uh, how this works. So you get a directory when you do a deployment called cdk.out, and this is where all of the stuff it generates lives. So having a look in here, here's my S3 bucket. And so it's generated the cloud formation for me. So I don't have to write it by hand. Great. So now let's start taking this a little bit further. So I want to show you some of the things that I really like about the CDK in terms of how I work with them um, so that we can go through and start uh, sort of seeing some real benefits of this compared to working with um, native cloud formation. So let's, uh, let's assume that the next thing I want to do is I want to write a Lambda function. So I'm going to create, uh, let's call this function.ts for TypeScript and let's export async function handler console.log hello world world's most complicated lambda function right there so typically speaking when you want to write a lambda function uh, to go in your cloud formation template there's a few steps you need to follow i need to create a zip file of the the contents i then need to get that into s3 and then i need to tell my cloud formation template hey here's the path to the zip file right? yeah all things but it takes a bit of work to do. I've also got the added thing here of this is in TypeScript, so I want to compile it down to JavaScript as well. So I want to introduce you to the Node.js lamp, Node Lambda function construct. My function. So what this thing has is, and I'm just going to import start as path. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to uh, compile that TypeScript for me, create a zip file for me, put it into S3 for me, and then generate a CloudFormation template that points directly to that. All those steps that you previously had to do manually, it's going to do that all for me. Um, so I'm just going to say path.resolve, directory name, function.ts. And let's set some other properties on here. So function name, Brian live demo. And like you see, I get a whole bunch of other things in here as well, like the uh, the usual things I can do with a cloud, uh, with a Lambda function. So if I close that so you can actually see the properties, things like, you know, dead letter queues or environment variables or things like setting how much memory or Lambda layers, all of this stuff is available to me to really easily go in and create. So, what I'm going to do here is let's go and do another quick deploy of that. Now, if you've ever written a Lambda function in CloudFormation, you'll notice there's probably a couple of things that I haven't included here. Um, actually, I'm going to stop that first and just install ES build quickly, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, but there's a couple of things that you'll see that I haven't done um, as far as doing uh, this one. I haven't created a IAM policy for that Lambda function. Um, I haven't had to create a CloudWatch log group for that function. Um, what the CDK does 
by default when working with these constructs is we say, well, we know a Lambda function needs CloudWatch logs and an IAM role. So it's going to create those for me. Again, less code I need to write. In fact, if I go in and have a look at that CloudFormation template that it generated, you see there's an IAM role that is assumable by Lambda. Uh, it's got the basic Lambda permissions on it by default. Um, there's the actual function pointing to the location in S3 that it's generated this all out for me. Uh, so this, this touches a little bit on what we call bootstrapping. Uh, so there's a one-off thing that you do to an AWS account before you can deploy CDK apps to it uh, that essentially tells it, here's where you can shove your S3 files and, and other assets. Right? But because of that, it makes it really easy for me. It just goes and, and does all of these things for me. Um, and so that's now you can see creating the Lambda function. Now, to explain the other step I took in there of installing ES build, uh, so anyone who's a, a JavaScript developer will, uh, you might have come across this, but essentially what I'm doing here is compiling that, ja uh, that TypeScript down to JavaScript, including all of its dependencies, so that it's all available for me in that zip file. Um, so this means I don't need to worry about sort of separating all the lambdas out into their own um, separate directories with their own separate package.json files with specific things. It just figures out based off what I've imported. Just give me the bare minimum of what I need for that function and make it go. Um, if you don't install ESBuild um, and you do have Docker available, it'll just spin up a Docker container with ESBuild and do the build for you. Right? It handles all of that. But, um, but essentially, now that that's done, you will see... I come back over here and refresh. I've now got a Lambda function and an IAM role, and, uh, and it's done all of that for me. So that's kind of cool. Now, the next thing is a little bit around IAM permissions. Right? So I haven't had to write the IAM role for that Lambda function, but let's say, hypothetically speaking, that I need it to read and write some files from that bucket that I've just created. What I can do in CloudFormation is I would go through, I would write an IAM policy by hand. Um, I would probably over permission it because writing IAM policies by hand gets a little bit fiddly. Um, this gives me some nice shortcut methods to make it really easy to work with. So what I'm going to do is just assign these, my function, into some variables. And what I'm able to do is I can say my bucket dot grant let's say read write to my function. And it's that simple. So now if I wanted to see the cloud formation that, that spits out, and I'm just going to show you another command here, if I spell it correctly, uh, is CDK synth. This is essentially a way of saying just generate the cloud formation, but don't deploy it. All right, so it does all the local steps. It just skips the part where it hands it off to cloud formation. So now if I come back in and have a look at my template, what you can see is I've now got an IAM policy with all of the S3 permissions attached for reading and writing to that bucket, and it's automatically put it onto the IAM role of that Lambda function. So just as a point of reference here, like we are getting to the point, even before you get to the condition metadata, I'm at about 150 lines of cloud formation for the 20 odd lines of TypeScript that I've got here. So this is, you know, we're, we're sort of heading in the right direction for productivity. But, uh, it even goes a little bit further than that, and, and this is some of the reason I really like working with the CDK constructs. Let's say that I wanted to, uh, you know, for security policy reasons, I need to go back and put KMS encryption on that bucket. And it's a very good thing. You should all be encrypting stuff in your buckets. I'm going to go into here and say encryption, and that's going to be bucket encryption, and it gives me some options. So again, I've got things like enumerations. Right? In cloud formation, it's a string, and if you type it wrong or you get the case wrong, you try to deploy it, you wait for it to fail, then you see it comes back and you, you iterate on it. Um, so I'm just going to say, let's go KMS. Now, again, typically speaking, this is where I would say I need to go back and change my IAM policy to grant permissions to the key as well as um, the read-write permissions to the bucket. But what's that you hear? It does that for you too. That was a small giggle there. I'm going to take that. All right. So... Um, In-person audiences, I haven't had this for a little while. You're just going to need to accept the energy I've got here. <laughs> so the uh, you can see here, I've now got an additional thing on here that says I've got my encrypt and decrypt permissions on that KMS key automatically because it knows when it gives read-write access to that bucket, the bucket is encrypted, and so it needs that as well. I, as a developer, haven't had to think of that. I just said, make the bucket encrypted and off you go. 
Right, so this is some of the stuff that uh, I really like about working with the CDK in terms of some productivity benefits. But, uh, but I'm not done there in terms of reasons why this is better to work with. The next thing I want to show you is another command in the CDK CLI called CDK Watch. So what this is designed to do is watch for file changes in my local directory. And if it sees a change, automatically just feed that up to CloudFormation. So as I'm editing, changing properties and things like that, it's just going to be continuously deploying to CloudFormation in the background. Now, there's a couple of other things that we do that's a little bit smarter in terms of some of the types of resources, such as Lambda functions. If I, for example, go and change the code in my Lambda function, it'll see that, oh, that was just a code change. Rather than a full CloudFormation deployment, I'm just going to take that zip and just tell Lambda here's the new code, and so it happens faster. So for development purposes, this is a really quick way to be able to iterate on code that you're writing in Lambda functions without having to do CDK deploy, wait for the change set to be created, wait for it to go and deploy. It just happens. So right now, it's doing an initial deploy because it saw that it needed to do that. So that KMS key that I was talking about is just getting created, and, and we're doing that as a bit of a baseline. What I'm also going to open is just another terminal here so I can go and invoke that Lambda function. Lambda invoke. It's almost like I ran this one earlier today. So right now I can go and run that, and that's all good. So by the time this finishes, I'll be able to show you another couple of party tricks that we have in CDK Watch. Any questions so far? Is all this making sense? Is it very late in the day to be thinking about questions on technical topics? That's all fine too. All right, so. Now KMS key in place. It's running a little faster when I did it earlier today. I'm trying to buy time. <laughs> Let's just flick back across and have a look what's happening here. I'm just creating that KMS key. Yes. Uh, yes. Um. Yeah. You mentioned like just being actually spinning up it. What in that case, what's it actually testing? Yeah, so what what you're testing, so the, the question there was what are we, uh, JJ's prompted me to say the question again for the people on the broadcast. Um, <laughs> so the question was, what are we actually testing in those, those sort of test libraries if it's not actually spinning anything up? Uh, so this isn't an integration test per se because we're not deploying the cloud formation. What it does do is it synthesizes the actual cloud formation output and lets you validate um, the sort of expected properties of that. So rather than sort of unit testing the, the properties of my CDK objects, I'm actually generating the real cloud formation and I'm testing for properties in that. So essentially it lets me make sure that the, the generating match specific attributes that I'm looking for. So for example, I could write a test that says, uh, if I see any S3 buckets where KMS encryption is null, fail this test. So that way, uh, all S3 buckets have to have some level of encryption, and I can do those kind of tests. Um, I've got more complex examples um, in, in other libraries where I've done like making sure that IAM policies don't do things like don't let people create users or modify permissions and those kinds of things. Again, catch it all in, in the, the sort of unit testing. All right, so it's just updating the IAM policy. So we should be just about done on this, and we'll fall into watch mode. Great. So one of the things that you'll see immediately after that is what looks like some logs. So I invoke that Lambda function, and CDK Watch says, well, hold up, I know you've got a log group there. Well, I'm going to bring you those logs in real time, or near real time, it's a little bit of a lag behind it, uh, to show you those logs while you're watching your stack development. So think of this scenario here where I'm working on a Lambda function, and as I'm typing, it's bundling and deploying and bringing me logs as I execute it. So for example, Let's switch to this other one, and I'll run it again. And what you should see here is this will rotate through and spit out the logs from that CloudWatch log group. And you see the name of the log group off to the left here. Um, yep, there you go. So I'm able to watch those logs of things in my stack automatically while I'm watching the actual um, infrastructure as well. But let's go make another change. Comment on the stream.
Yeah, so the question there around uh, rolling back of resources, like if you accidentally put something into your stack that you don't want to be there, um, you can just simply remove it from the stack and do another deploy. Right, so because we're using CloudFormation as the execution engine here, when it sees that a resource that was previously in the template is now no longer there, it'll then go and remove that resource for you. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Um, so one of the things that uh, the eagle eyed among you might have noticed, and I'll just go back to highlight it, um, is the S3 bucket. And let me just bugger that off for a sec. Uh, find bucket. Um, we've actually got the retention policies set to retain by default, which means if I take it out, it'll remove it from the cloud formation stack, but retain the underlying resource. Now the CDK does this by default for pretty much any resource that stores data. So S3 buckets, RDS databases, DynamoDB tables, those kinds of things. Um, we do that to make sure that you don't inadvertently, while working with this sort of really fast language and way of modeling infrastructure, that you don't accidentally take out something that's got data on it. You can override those. You can go and change those values to whatever you want. But uh, so if you've taken it out of a CDK stack and it has data and it didn't go away, chances are this was why, and your, your fallback mechanism is then just go and delete it in the console if you don't want it. But, um, but anyway, so what I was about to show is if I go from hello world, I'll say hello, Canberra AWS user group. So what's going to happen here is it says, hey, I just saw that that file changed. I'm going to go and trigger a CDK deployment. Now, it's going to go through and, uh, and you see here that we've actually just hot swapped that Lambda function and it's already done. Right, so that compiled my TypeScript, zipped it, shoved it up into the Lambda service and is now ready to run again. So if we go and execute that Lambda function once more, you'll see the logs that will come back now will be the new version. So if you're a developer who's iterating on different Lambda functions and uh, you want that really quick deploy time to them running in the cloud, uh, this is a really great way to go about it. So there you go. Hello, Canberra AWS user group. Now, one last party trick that, uh, that I'm going to set up first and then explain it as I go, because it's going to take a, a little bit longer to deploy, is around the concept of CDK constructs that do a lot of different things for you. And this kind of ties into some of where James is going to go as well. So let me just dump this into the bottom here and clean up a few of these imports. Nothing quite like watching somebody else code live. ECS. All right, so that's now going through and doing a full deployment. All right, so a couple of things I want to show you. First of all, documentation. So this, uh, this website here is the CDK API reference. So this is where we have documentation on all of the constructs and how to use them. So you can see the, uh, the list down the left here is uh, about as extensive as the list of all of our services and things that exist in CloudFormation. You can go into any of these and find examples of how to use these constructs and details about the, the, you know, the cool, useful little things that they do. Uh, for example, like creating VPCs is a really great construct for that where you basically just say, I want a public subnet, a private subnet across three AZ and it goes and does everything for you. Um, so things like wrap tables and all of your individual subnets and uh, knuckles and all of that sort of jazz. Um, but the one in particular I wanted to show you here if, uh, for anyone who's working in containers is this concept here of our ECS patterns module. So the ECS patterns module is a bunch of pre-canned CDK resources uh, that are designed to uh, take really common scenarios when working with, in this case, ECS and containers and just give me everything for a couple of lines of code. So uh, in this case, the one that I've used is what we call the application load balanced Fargate service. So let me unpack all of what's going on here. So Fargate is our serverless container service where I can basically say, I've got these containers and I want to run them with this much CPU and memory, just make it go. I don't need to worry about the underlying size of the, the cluster where my containers are running. Um, we're going to take that container application, put it into Fargate. We're going to set it up with some default scaling policies and put it behind an application load balancer. So this way I'm automatically going to be load balancing um, across my multiple instances of my container. So I haven't specified a lot here, right? I've just said uh, I've created myself a new ECS cluster. I've set the uh, memory and CPU for the tasks that I want to run. 
And in this case, I'm just pulling one from a public registry. But uh, also worth knowing that the stuff I just showed you with Lambda functions for how we can bundle those up and publish them, we can do the same thing with Docker files. And I can literally have a Docker file locally and just say, from this Docker file, give me an application load balanced uh, Fargate service, and it'll go and do the rest. Now, there's a lot of defaults being assumed in here. Um, I like to call these uh, intelligent defaults where we try to be relatively smart about the where the defaults lie. I'm, I'm wary of the term best practice because that's really can context sensitive kind of thing. But uh, but we start with these default values that uh, we go in and, and spit out for you. Now, to show you just how much time that has saved me, anyone want to take a stab at how many lines of cloud formation is going to be in this thing when I open it back up? Come on, pick a number. doesn't matter if you're wrong. I'm not expecting a correct answer here. All right, fine. Uh, <laughs> Hundreds. Uh, JJ is correct. Uh, if we scroll down to where the metadata starts, uh, we are just north of a thousand lines of cloud formation. Uh, there is a whole lot that has been generated in there. Uh, by default, it gives me a new VPC with some default settings around public and private subnets and route tables. It puts the Fargate cluster into that VPC for me. Uh, it's going to go through and put an application load balancer in there. It's going to set up security groups and routing and all of this sort of stuff. And I just don't need to care. And as a developer, things that I don't need to care about make me very, very happy. So this is going to deploy for a little while, um, and I, uh, I may or may not actually sit around waiting for it to, uh, if it thinks it's done, I don't think that that's the case. <laughs> I'm going to have full deployment on that. Oops. No, wait, route table, yeah, okay. So uh, at that point, oh, that went a lot quicker than earlier today. So at that point, congratulations, I can click a link. There's my load balancer with my container sitting in there, and I have done just so little code to make that happen. Um, so these are the kinds of things that, as a developer working with modeling of infrastructure, that it makes my life so much easier. I can worry about the things that really add value to the overall process and what's going on and spend less time worrying about have I done the minimum IAM permissions to follow the security practices and make the security people happy, right? So th this is the kind of pitch I give to customers when they're thinking, should I use the CDK or should I use CloudFormation or should I use, um, you know, insert third-party tool here that models infrastructure for you? There's a few of them out there. Um, this sort of process as a developer, can really speed up the, the time to value there. And that's where I think the CDK is, is really worth looking at. So at this point, I want to bring James up and he's going to start talking through some of the lessons he's learned and, and things um, from working with actual customers doing some of this uh, sort of stuff in multiple teams. James. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Um, did you want your Coke? <laughs> Hi. Multiple presenters. Um, Hi, I'm James. Uh, I'm a cloud architect in professional services. And I've actually been doing quite a bit of work with Brian on the side because uh, I consider Brian our resident uh, in Canberra CDK expert. And largely my focus is not so much on uh, CDK development itself, but in enabling other people to do CDK development. So all those things that Brian is picking up on there about how do I move quickly as a developer? What's my experience like? How do I actually deploy things really quickly? Um, that's the kind of experience that... Um, we want to enable in an organization. So for a recent customer, spent about eight months there building out um, the central function for developer enablement, and that's the context in which I want to talk about CDK. Um, so I want to rewrite that question a little bit <clears throat> to how to enable development teams to write applications and share best practices using CDK constructs. And I love all the things that Brian was saying about um, the personal developer experience. You know, I go into an account, I write my bootstrap, I get going, I deploy code. <clears throat> and that sort of personal experience is, is useful and good when you're doing proofs of concept. It's really useful for if you're, you know, a very small team perhaps. But how do you scale that out across development teams and how as a potentially as a central um, team do you enable lots of teams to do the same thing. How do you bring all of that resources together? And how do you keep that um, sort of best CDK construct that Brian was talking about? You know, I just want to run an ECS cluster, but combine that with 
your particular organization's security posture or the way you want to do monitoring. How do you bring all that together, not abstract in such a way that you you lose that power and that speed, but also um, share what you've learned with everyone else? So let's dive into a few things. Uh, there's a couple of level setting terms I want to go through, more around the multi-cloud space. I've spoken with a few people in the room uh, before, is and I know many of you are developers, is anyone actually involved in like running a central cloud team? Just anyone at all? No? Okay, so those are some of the terms I want to level set and maybe we'll kind of uh, skip a bit past that if you're more sort of in the development space. It's, I want to talk about how to roll out those prerequisites to provide good team isolation and also allow for the teams to contribute, which feeds into artifact sharing, how to generate them quickly, how to reduce friction um, between the teams so that you're not, as a developer, thinking, how do I share this? You're thinking, how do I build it in your area of specialty? Uh, a couple of points about what a good construct looks like. Um, extending on those concepts that Brian mentioned, and a few sort of areas you might want to look into later. So in terms of a level setting or setting the context for the conversation, these, I love pictures, so this is kind of the picture I have of, of what a central team cares about. And so we look at things like landing zone, um, cloud foundations, and usually the team we talk about it as is the cloud platform engineering team, or you can just think of it as the central team the central AWS team who, who manages the organization and gives you access to your account. Um, JJ mentioned the AWS Landing Zone Accelerator. Uh, really exciting there, especially if you do like CDK, because I think app devs can get more involved in that central team. Whereas before it was like very much infrastructure focused, cloud formation, now there's an opportunity for people with more of an app dev background like myself to come in and go, actually, I can read CDK and, and I can think in terms of um, procedural programming uh, and reuse and, and look at that solution and roll out changes as well. But at the moment, the key way to roll out changes to enable developers are the ones at the top. You're either using something like another solution called customizations for control tower or CloudFormation stack sets. And this is a way to say, I want this change and I want it deployed to this part of the organization and not that. And so that's going to be really important when we start talking about separating one development team from another. At the same time as, as using the same code and not trying to, you know, cookie cut individually everybody's access. Um, feel free as well uh, to yell out with questions if, um, if any of this isn't making sense. Now, this picture here is one of many, uh, the links on the bottom of the page. This is actually what uh, we put in that white paper for cloud foundations. And there's a lot going on. Um, definitely not talking about all of it. Um, you can see the types of concerns that a central team is interested in. How do I govern this? What's the operations like? Where's security at? Uh, these are not typically things that the developers will go, hey, yeah, that's, that's what I'm interested in. And the piece focusing in on is that infrastructure capability, the template management. That is where, when you dig into what that means, it's all about how does a central team enable developers? Template management here is all that good stuff Brian was mentioning, it's reuse. How does one team create templates that another team can reuse so that you can do governance once and then every bucket sort of within patterns conforms to what you know, you told security you were going to do. So in terms of rolling out prerequisites, um, Brian mentioned bootstrapping. I'm going to go into account structure, uh, talk a little bit about artifact repositories, and then a central publishing pipeline that, that I put in at this customer to um, make the whole thing sort of come together. So this is what we ended up with as a typical account structure for a team. And here we have a DevOps account on the left, and that DevOps account has some tools in there. It probably has your source code repo. If you're using code commit, that's code commit. If you're using any of a number of other um, products, you can sort of OAuth to those and use CodeStar. Um, 
one particular customer was using Bitbucket. That worked great. Didn't really affect the architecture at all. Um, I know everyone uses the exact same tools everywhere you go. Uh, so, you know, every one of these pieces can be replaced is kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it. I'm also showing uh, the AWS service uh, code artifact, which is a, an artifact repository, a cloud native one. Uh, this doesn't, again, swap that out for the one, your tool of choice. In pink, I've shown the, um, the bootstrap that Brian was talking about. And the bootstrap is everything that CDK needs to deploy your resources. And in a multi-account environment, that can be a little bit more interesting because usually you just go, you know, CDK bootstrap. It's like, well, I'm making sure that I can deploy in my account with pretty much admin privileges. That's your kind of starting point. Here, the central team can roll out a change to say, developers aren't allowed to deploy to dev directly. They actually have to use the CI/CD pipeline in, in the DevOps account. And the DevOps account is allowed to deploy on their behalf to dev test prod, add seven environments, whichever ones you have. And so here you notice it says DevOps as a qualifier. Think of this like namespacing in, in any other space you've been in. You can isolate teams from each other. You can isolate applications from each other. And so you can sort of end up with something that looks a little bit like this. You have multiple DevOps accounts, one for each of your specialty teams, each of whom has their own isolated lifecycle accounts. And you can manage that bootstrap permissions separately. So if you have a DevOps team that's focused on AIML, well, you can focus in on the services they're interested in. If, you, if you've got a more sort of traditional serverless or container-based, you can start to focus. And so you've got these two perspectives. One is the developer wanting to move fast. How do I you know, do what I need to do? And you've also got the governance that comes in and, and they can meet without actually having to necessarily compete because you go, okay, what do you need? These, fantastic, we apply that. And then security's happy because they're like, well, there's 50 other services you haven't needed and, I, and they're not accessible, but all the ones you have said you need are there. You can also then go further if you want and um, codify these into patterns if you've got similar types of teams, but that's probably a sort of a future concern. This diagram shows code artifact as the artifact repository. It shows it in context of your DevOps account. Now, again, replace the tool with your tool of choice. If you use, you know, JFrog Artifactory, Sonatype Nexus, um, or any, you know, even a custom one for yourselves that you install, you can just replace that. This shows how you can have a central team manage your internet access so that you can control all the packages coming into the environment. So you can still have your approval processes. You know, you make sure that you can get access to the ones you need, the packages you need, but you have some way of controlling the flow in. The, from a code perspective, there's a few extra lines for logging in. And as a central team, you can uh, configure everything so that developers don't have to think about it. And you know, your CI CD pipeline needs to log into your repo. It's probably the same for um, your JFrogs and the others. You, you can also separate your developer team who want to build their own artifacts and not share them with the rest of the organization. Nobody else cares about their app. They care about the, the artifacts that are for sharing. And so those can seamlessly kind of live in a central area, but be accessed um, where it's needed. This was built as a sort of a, a one-to-many scenario. So the question online is, how do the different dev teams have a helper around their CDK to show what SCPs will prevent them from deploying their stacks? How do they have a helper to prevent them? What was it? How do they have a helper around their CDK to show what SCPs will uh, That's a great question. Um, I don't think that would be something that you do as a helper. No, you there's do have nothing in the CDK for it. Um, you could potentially write something yourself to interrogate those SCPs first. Um, because, because it's all code, right? You could 
have okay. that as part of your your um, synth process, right? So the, one of the files I didn't touch in my demo uh, was what was in the bin directory, which is uh, essentially the steps it goes through for synthesis. Um, you could go through and do that and then synthesize it, do some comparison yourself on the cloud formation to see if that's going to work. Um, it's a bit of work, but you could get there, but it, it'd be a custom thing. There's nothing native to custom. For that. The challenge that I see there is that SCPs are in the central area and your code is running somewhere else. So you can, for example, you could integrate with your IAM policy sim, which will give you an indication of, uh, you know, you try and test, um, you know, these are my permissions, test them, and you could definitely write something custom around that. Uh, it's not going to be super clear programmatically that SCPs are the cause of your issue. Um, good one to dive deep on, though. Don't have an easy answer for that. Um, so in terms of this also shows one final point on this diagram. It shows that the central team operating out of the management account deploy the bootstrap to the accounts that the developers are working in. And it importantly shows the role that gets created and that it trusts their DevOps account. And that's the foundation. If you try and, if a developer in this environment goes CDK deploy without any anything else, uh, it actually fails because they won't have permission to to do so and they won't be able to deploy to their dev account because there's no role for it. They don't have access, they don't have permission. So this at scale allows a separation from your DevOps concerns. You are allowed to deploy here, you are not. But it also makes it simple and should achieve what Brian wants, which is that fast cycle within their own space. The Biggest thing that the central team can do to enable everybody else is take over the publishing. One publishing pipeline can support all the different specialty teams you have. Um, I probably won't major on this one. What we did was use the feature of um, code commit, which says you can have multiple source repos. Um, the development teams could actually just use something like Progen, generate out uh, a JSII construct and just have a node application. No thought of CICD, no thought of publishing, no permission to publish, but whatever they wrote was published. And nice at the other end, you can do event-based um, triggers. So you could, like Brian's done in the past, create an application. As soon as a upstream dependency changes, automatically trigger your CICD to a test environment and run canaries so that you can you don't have to think about, am I in line with my upstream dependencies? You just are, which is really, really interesting concept. Uh, Brian touched on the different languages, and I'm sure you all use exactly the same language, and all the developers around you love the exact same language. Um, I found this to be a really good visual for why I would recommend someone to use TypeScript. So on the left, you have constructs that you're writing. In the middle, you have the repository where they live. Then you have the stacks, which are your applications, and, and lambdas. And in this particular case, someone was saying, well, I want to use Python for everything. What, you know, why shouldn't I just use Python? I'm like, use Python, it's great. What's, you know, what are you trying to do? Do you want to, you know, well, I, I, you know, I want to write my lambdas in Python. Perfect, that affects nobody but your team. Um, do you want to share your artifacts? And they went, well, yes. Okay, so you're writing these artifacts, who's going to use them? And as soon as you start to unpack that, they go, well, actually, I don't know what they're going to use. And so a good practice is to write your constructs, anything you're extending with a CDK in TypeScript. If you really know that you're just a Python shop and you're always going to be a Python shop, go for it write in Python. Just know that without that JSII layer to generate the other stubs, you're sort of limiting your consumers a little bit. Um, <coughs> for that project, I actually, you know, the Java background, I learned TypeScript for it. Um, it was pretty easy as a developer, I'd say. I'd encourage you to, you know, learn and, and do something there in that space. Keeping in mind also that constructs are not full-blown applications. They are a small piece of code, very focused around something you're building. And so switching from, um, you know, your sort of node or other types of 
language constructs to TypeScript um, is fairly straightforward. And when you've got all that good IntelliSense, like Brian was showing, it makes it even easier to kind of transition between the different technologies. Okay, good custom constructs. My first point here, and what I was encouraging customers to do is don't abstract and lose all the richness of CDK. One example from a past life when I was, doing a Java, I was a Java developer, someone, a central team built an, an abstract class for all the messaging components. And you know, there was all these great patterns like fire and forget and asynchronous request response. And, and then they, they brought it down to a single method, which was synchronous request response. And when I think of that, I think that's bad abstraction. It's like you have all this really good richness of all these patterns that you could possibly do, and then you've sort of arbitrarily sort of cobbled them because it's simpler for you as a, a central team. Um, this code on the right is uh, an example of a base Lambda, which we wrote for the customer, and it doesn't change what you can access in the, in the Lambda. You know, it's got a function there. You can set all the same parameters on Lambda, but you can provide sens like uh, sensible defaults. And the key reason why it was abstracted or extended was to add monitoring. So that as you start to assemble all these varied components together, you can actually include monitoring as one of your core pieces. You say, in my DevOps account, I want a dashboard dynamically for my application. And so here, the ad monitoring sort of happens automatically on every Lambda. So if you have five Lambdas, I'll just finish this point. If you've got five Lambdas and you've decided that these three metrics are, are critical for you on any Lambda, you don't have to think about that in terms of getting them on your dashboard because the assembly process deals with creating the CloudWatch dashboard in the DevOps account and the metrics in the lower accounts and so every time you add a new Lambda, it just appears on your dashboard with all the metrics you care about. Wait, I'm not... So a question sort of catching up on the stream um, it was around, isn't the, the concept of writing everything in TypeScript sort of against the, the selling point of use whatever language your team is comfortable with? Sure. You know, isn't that kind of the point? Um, so yeah, so the question about uh, one of the selling points of CDK is multiple languages, and that's fantastic. Here I'm talking about as a central team writing um, constructs that you want to share everywhere. Uh, going back to that, that picture, I think it's perfectly valid if you think Python is the way forward for your organization and you just want to use Python. And it's, the same goes for all the other languages. You just got to be aware that, that it doesn't give you that automatic sharing for polyglot and that may not matter to you so i think the cdk selling point about multiple languages is fantastic here we're saying as a central team you probably want to um, take advantage of that by writing in typescript so everyone else gets the advantage of choice so here is an example of sensible defaults with the ability to override um, this is you know, for example, the function name was generated. Uh, you can generate it as part of your app so you can really clearly see it. Again, take it away from the developer about um, naming standards. Uh, I didn't put the generation code in there, but it sort of builds it up based on the variables you've given in your stack. Um, by default, everything should be tracing active for this case, but the dot, dot, dot config means, uh, you know, look, let, let it be overridden effectively. And you can do it either way. So you can go, uh, I want to make sure that this parameter is never overridden. There's a security constraint. It has to be encrypted and it has to be encrypted in this way. And so you could do that. Um, or you can do the other way and go, this is what I think people should do, but override me if you like. Both of those patterns are quite good depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think it's a really Good way of thinking about it from that central central uh, specialist perspective is how are people going to extend this? How are people going to compose their apps? Um, and don't artificially get in their way. So these are the constructs that we built. And you'll notice that it's not, it, this was for a, an application modernization project. So number one, didn't override everything in CDK. 
just picked the, the components that made sense because we were value adding. Um, you know, there's quite significant services like CloudFront, but then tiny services like a table in DynamoDB uh, or a bucket. And the primary reason for overriding most of these was the monitoring. What we also did down the bottom was have the larger patterns, the reuse and the large, the, the let me pick this up and just be able to deploy a whole application. Uh, so there was a, a front end, a web web app front end. Uh, there was a Docker scenario with um, sort of X-ray as a, a sidecar. Uh, those front end components used the base components to aggregate them together sensibly. There's also a few public um, uh, sort of repositories of um, CDK constructs, solution constructs that you can use to piece together a complicated pattern from simple building blocks. Um, this one is when you're doing it specifically for your org. So you say, we always do web apps, or we always do them in this way. And so if, in this case, the, the web app front end would say, well, we're always going to have CloudFront. It's always going to have a bucket. We, we're always going to have a WAF on it, and it's going to be configured in these ways. And you know, if you're going to include a REST API, it's going to be Lambda-based, which talks to a DynamoDB. So you can assemble them all together, or you can just use the, the pattern and then focus on your code. So what's the web app you're doing? What is your static content? Uh, what is the contents of your Lambda? And you get this nice balance between the central team controlling security and, and patterns and knowing what's out there and the developers who just get to move quickly and focus on what they care about. So I was going to kind of stop there. There are other things that can be talked about. One of the nice use cases we did was actually build out one of these shared constructs was the CICD um, pattern. So no one actually had to build their own CICD. They just imported the CICD and then had a config file that said where they want to deploy and and where their application code was. And that way we were able to say, well, you have security testing. If you're a um, REST API, give us your Postman file. We'll run those for you, fail the build if it doesn't succeed. Um, things like that. And another idea that I'll just throw out there was the idea of actually taking that pipeline config and taking it away from the developers. So maybe your your senior le uh, developer or tech lead might want to say where things deploy, how they deploy, what pattern you use, you're using GitLab flow, your Git flow, how you're approaching it. You separate that out from the developers, you can security control that so that you can say the definition of the pipeline is under one group and the, the pipeline, the code, et cetera, uh, is under the developer's control. Just going to pause for any any questions, and that's kind of where I wanted to end. Is a question of okay. Uh, yeah, so there was a, a question going back to the bootstrapping here. How would we go about reconciling the requirements of CDK roles slash permissions with a pre-existing deployer role or permissions, uh, which needs to be assumed? Can I import existing permissions uh, from an existing platform action template, or do we need to change existing roles to meet CDK requirements? And there's a lot in there, isn't it? Yeah. Great that people could type things. <laughs> uh, what's your take on it, Brian, reading it? Can you... Yeah, look, so, so my take on it, so when when you do that CDK deploy command that, uh, that I was uh, yeah. pushing through, um, when you bootstrap the account, um, and you can bootstrap into different namespaces as well, so each one has its own thing there, by default, it gets an IAM role um, that is assumed when you do that um, deployment in a CloudFormation, right? So if you've got an existing IAM role, you can simply bootstrap and, and do it you need to and say use this existing role uh, that's been created elsewhere. So you very much so got the ability to do that fire or just for the default CDK context is as well. So you can use those existing. I think part of the question as well was about, you know, I'm developing my app and I find a new permission, mm. but this bootstrap is now done by somebody else. I, is that part of the question that it's it's yeah. about the person who asked the question right. didn't see this. <laughs> so, because part of the answer here is that typical um, development team versus security team perspective. So here, the bootstrap, you don't want to go full admin permissions. So you want coarse grain services you expect to use. 
there's, there's some really good stuff you can do there as well around. Um, you might set up in the, the early phases of your project uh, an IAM role for that bootstrap to deploy as, yep. uh, but then go and use tools like IAM Access Analyzer yep. to see what permissions that deployment role is actually using and then scope it down accordingly for your uh, test and production accounts. Yep. Um, so that's a really good way to sort of there as well. Yeah, good point. Um, there's another question in the chat if nobody else in the room's got one, uh, which is around how does unit testing work? That's uh, where you picked it That's up before. more my domain. So, <laughs> well, actually, I might talk to it. So, because yeah, like, I didn't talk about the CI CD pipeline and the stages in there, I don't have a picture for it, but Brian talked about unit testing uh, within the code. And so, typically, the very first stage of your CI CD pipeline is do that unit testing and make sure you get the reports out to a central location. But then you probably want to go further. And so, you want to add a stage in for your security testing. And you might use tools like from some of our partners like Sneak, um, or you might use something like uh, CDK NAG. Um, there's actually a bunch there, like CFN Guard might be useful, but CDK NAG understands CDK uh, better than running CFN NAG, which is for cloud formation. Um, that's a subtle thing, actually, because if you run CFN NAG, you tend to it's a little bit difficult to trace back to where the problem lies because you're one step removed from what it found. But CDK NAG is actually the same idea, but actually tailored for CDK. So you can put those as stages in your CI CD pipeline um, and then run also, you should be looking at integration tests um, and even potentially canary deployments uh, to deploy to an account. One of the ones that um, we looked at for this DevOps, no, not for this one, for, sorry, I'll just get the right picture. For this published pipeline, one idea we were exploring was actually a kitchen sink app, mainly for security, to say, everyone's published all of these components. Let's make sure we deploy every single one of them in an account not controlled by developers, and security can go for their life there and put all the detective controls they like, find out things like what Brian was saying, uh, the developers haven't overridden the KMS aspect of, um, you know, buckets or other things, and look at those as a security kind of invariant. Yeah, the the other one I'll add there, and I've uh, I've just dropped the link into the chat uh, for anyone who's on the live stream, and if anyone in person wants to see it, come and harass me afterwards. Um, I've got a sample repo that's got a bunch of different types of unit tests for CDK stuff that sort of shows the different ways you can test for different things. Um, I could honestly do a full one-hour presentation on just how we do unit testing in, in this sort of stuff, so I won't go into the depths of it, but there's some good examples there, I think, to start with. Are there any other questions in the room or? No. Might hand back JJ to. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've learned my lesson. At least I'll do it again next time. No worries about that. Um, thank you both, Brian and James. Thank you to everyone who's turned up in person as well. Um, this is our first one back in person. Um, for those in the room, so come up, have a chat to some of the AWS people. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you like about the format. So as much as we love talking about AWS, we've got a bit of flexibility now. Like, do we want to think about different formats? We've got a ton of whiteboards, a ton of smart people in the office. Let us know what would actually be fun, what would actually be useful for you. And let's think about what we can do with this user group from here on out and, um, and what we might be able to do with the time we've got. Um, let us know feedback on the session. The guys will be hanging around for a while afterwards. You're welcome to have um, plenty of uh, pizza and drinks and stuff out the front. And for those of you online, hello, join us for pizza and drinks and stuff next time. Thank you all. Um, that's kind of all we've got in terms of presentations and um, sort of the, the lecture content. So yeah, feel free to hang around for a while, as I said. And uh, for everyone online, thank you for joining us and we will see you next month.